Hi, I'm Connie Guglielmo with CNET, and I'm joined today by John Chambers, a former CEO of Cisco and now a venture capitalist here in Techland. We're going to talk a little bit about the crazy world that we're living in and how you manage it from a business perspective. We are going to look at some of the issues that are facing uh, startups and businesses today as they cope with this extraordinary time in which we're living again, the pandemic is really top of mind for all, but also it's brought cultural and societal changes. It's changed the way we live and work. And I can't think of a better person to talk about that with us than John Chambers. John, I'm gonna start with the obvious question, which is you have survived many different kinds of extraordinary situations, not just financial and economic crisis, but you've also been through other situations, health crises. And I know that we talked about even a global supply chain issue. So talk about a little bit, looking back at the past year, what you see that's different from how you've managed other crises with what we're living with now and what that means, what people should know about. Connie, it's a pleasure to be with you again. And I'll try to address these comments to the audience in terms of how, if I were to start up watching this, what could I learn from our answers? This is my sixth financial crisis, my fifth pandemic, although but obviously the most serious, my third supply chain issue. And we also have some politics around the world that we're all aware of that add a little bit extra challenge to this. What is different? It's all four at once and the speed is different. However, how you handle it is the same. You basically determine how much was self-inflicted and there will always be elements of that with every one of you and how much of it was market inflicted. Develop your playbook, three to five moves you're gonna to make to navigate through this and survive. Communicate to your employees, to your customers, to your investors, what is that plan? And then paint the picture almost in a two-step move for what you look like when you come out. And as you've come through it, and hopefully you've already done this, you've got your expenses in line now, now start talking about how you grow again in this new environment. So that playbook is the same, Connie. Okay, well, what mistakes then do you think people make? Are there some that are specific to this situation or that generally they should avoid? Or maybe it's a little bit of both. Well, I've, I've, I've done a lot of things well and I've made a lot of mistakes. I've seen every movie. Uh, the mistakes are, are, are typical. Uh, they don't follow a playbook like we just covered. They don't deal with fixing their problems as well as the major macro issue. Uh, they don't communicate with their employees and their customers doing this. They don't paint the picture of what they want to do when they come out. And a CEO's role or a founder role is just four things in good times and bad strategy and vision of the company, develop, recruit, retain, and change the management team to implement that, communications and culture. During these downturns, communications and culture is actually even more important than strategy and vision. And often leaders don't spend the time on both they should. Well, let's talk about that. We're living through a time of very interesting social change. Mm -hmm. Diversity, culture are top of mind for lots of folks. There have been many requests to change the way that businesses work because there has um, been this interpretation or this assessment that businesses have not caught up with society and that we're lagging, especially on cultural issues. So let's start by defining culture. What is your definition of culture at a company? Well, culture is what the CEO, she or he decides it is. They've got to own it, they've got to articulate it. And the culture using Google, Microsoft, Cisco, an Oracle, my startups, night and day different, doesn't mean each company won't be successful. And you've got to write down what it is. What is your mission? What are your elements of your culture? And then you've got to stand behind it. For me, it usually starts, if I were a startup, thinking about put your customers first. Uh, just do the right thing. Make innovation happen. Decide what kind of company you want. Are you a family or are you a professional sports team? Up and out type of approach. Write them down and recruit to that in terms of the direction. Uh, in terms of the bigger society issues you raised, Connie, uh, I think there's a tug of war. During the 90s, when you know, I was honored with John Doerr and Jim Barksdale to form TechNet and represent the high-tech companies, uh, tech was largely for good. And 90% of Americans, as an example, and Europeans believe tech was good for them and good for their country. Today, it's less than 50-50. And so I believe the new definition of capitalism is about economic return to your shareholders, but also focus on really making a difference in society. So I think there are two key elements of the future of capitalism. If that doesn't happen, you will see governments and society self-correct. Okay, so what you're saying is that startups should start from the outset with an altruistic mindset. They're serving customers, but they're doing good for society. That's a very broad, I, I hate to say Miss America kind of line. What does that mean tactically 
you know, I'm a, I'm a startup CEO. I come and sit down and talk to you. I want to do the right thing. Uh, so many people don't do that though. What, what does that mean? What do you tell me in that? Well, meeting? first, the majority of startups won't do what I just said. I know that I'm telling you how you win. Yeah, and Cisco is number one in corporate social responsibility with Democrats, Republicans, Middle East, China, always there. And we were the most profitable company in every one of those countries where we did the corporate social responsibility. Our attrition rate ran 5% and an industry runs 15%. We were able to acquire companies because they fit into our culture. So first decide what you want. And if you do want to say, I think I owe an obligation to be economically successful, but also very much focus on being able to make a difference in society, then do that from the beginning and build it into your culture. I think you'll get the benefits from it. Do I expect the majority of people listening to this? No, I do not. Uh, but that's why I kind of challenge you. Why, why don't they do it? Is it because it's something that they think they can address later and put well, off? Sometimes Connie people think they can address it later, such as diversity or, or building in a customer first mentality or building in quality being important. And at the beginning, they kind of maybe ignore that. Uh, I think that's a mistake. It's very hard to make those cultural changes later. And so uh, just decide what you want to be. Don't kid yourself. That's why the CEO, she or he has to own it. And then you got to walk the talk for better or for worse in terms of what you are and what you're not. While we're talking about culture, let's just talk about the makeup of what a successful company looks like today and going into the future. I, I talked about diversity being top of mind for, for many people. And it's not just gender diversity, it's racial diversity. It's even a diversity of perspective uh, among the staff. So if you were building a startup today, and I know uh, from your perch as a venture capitalist, now you see many companies doing that. What is the recommendation? How do you build that diverse, uh, globally minded, um, progressive thinking staff about what the team should look like? So the first reason uh, that I would state that you wanna do that is diverse teams always how to execute teams that look alike. And you start with the business return. And when you have the business return, it's a lot easier to say, then do the, what's right for society. But first, decide as a leader, do you believe that? And if you don't, or you're not going to do it, don't kid yourself. But if you are going to do it, then you do it in the right way. You have to walk the talk. You have to make culture part of each of your discussions. You have to make sure that you protect the diversity on your team and that when people are being treated in ways that often are subconscious in ways that aren't the right way to treat diverse teams, whether it's as simple as time zone meetings between the US and India, uh, or as complex uh, talking over your, your gender counterpart uh, in a discussion rather than giving her a chance to speak out in her views. And then you've got to lead by the example and you've got to constantly learn and you've got to say, what is that culture and how do you make it happen? And then you've got to go out of your way to make sure you get the right talent together to make that happen in, in a total way, regardless of color of skin, sexual orientation, religion, gender, et cetera. It will make your company much stronger, in my opinion, and I think great companies will do that better than the ones that, uh, that don't do it. Yeah, I, I'm just gonna nudge on this point a little bit because someone as a tech reporter here in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. we've now had the benefit of seeing some companies release their diversity reports every year. And then Needle really hasn't moved that much on those diversity reports. These are smart companies that have given us very inventive technology that really has transformed the way they live in, uh, we all live and work. And I just, just still kind of at a loss as to why diversity is a challenge that somehow we can't overcome. Well, first, I think we can overcome it. But secondly, I agree with your premise. Most companies and the total of big companies have not changed the needle that much, including CEOs who are female, as an example, or diversity on the board or diversity at the senior part of the, the team. Uh, it is much more difficult for a company that didn't build this in from the beginning to suddenly change it. And even companies that believe in it, their founders believe in it, like Sheryl Sandberg is a great example. It's hard to change an existing company. Uh, when you see people try and you don't get the results, the definition of insanity is continue to do the same thing and expect a different result. Uh, you've got to say, how are you going to change it? I think it is the people watching this podcast that will change it. I think startups have the chance to build that in from the very beginning. You have a chance to build in that diversity and all the aspects we talked about from the beginning. And I think you will be the role model for the future. So I strongly encourage my, my startups, the ones that I coach directly and indirectly, make it part of your culture, really make it happen and understand if we're easy, it already be done. 
But this is where all the hiring is going to take place. The large companies are not going to add headcount in the next decade. Uh, automation and AI and other capabilities means that all job growth, regardless of what country you are in the world, in total will come from startups. So you can build this, you can change it. I think you will if you have the courage to do it. Do it because it's also the right return for you economically. I want to switch tacks now and talk about technology. If the pandemic has shown us nothing else, it is that dig digital tech is now an even more important part of the way we live and work. Technology companies ha have been weathering the storm pretty well. Zoom has become a verb. I'm talking to you over Zoom. Yes. Talk about uh, the advantage that you see that the tech industry, which has had kind of a black eye over the past few years, there are all sorts of regulatory issues. We won't go into that, but really just where do you see tech as an industry positioned today and going forward? All right, I'm going to be controversial. I think the tech industry in total will outperform traditional business by 2x in the next decade. So literally 100% more effective returns than if you invested in a traditional business. Secondly, Connie, every company is going to become a tech company. I don't care if you're in healthcare, manufacturing, finance, retail, uh, everybody understands you're going to get Amazon uh, if you don't change and the issues that go with that. And I think it will be built deep into the culture of these companies. What I would look for is a market transition enabled by new technology. You said it right. Every company is going to become a digital company. And the new technologies such as AI, 5G, uh, the Internet of Things, computing, I'm sorry, cloud moving to the edge will enable the new business models. So I think this is where all the growth will come. It will be different than the prior ones. Originally, I thought we'd probably have 40 percent of our tech companies fail during this downturn. And I got into it very quickly and realized the reverse was happening. Money was flowing even more into the tech companies and every company is becoming a tech company. So unlike 2001, where 50% uh, of venture capital backed startups failed because of the dot com bust, and 2008, the Great Recession, where 30% failed, I thought 40% was safe in between the two. It won't be near that high. The reason is very simple every company becomes a digital tech company driven by new technology. You mentioned some of the technologies that you think are going to transform AI, the cloud. Are, are those your top two picks of things that people should be looking at? I think actually my top two picks, number one, AI. It might be the first technology since the internet with Cisco, changing the way you work, live, learn, and play. And it was a rush uh, uh, to be part of that. Uh, to the cloud, which I think we all understood, it delivered on its promises or more. Uh, I think AI will be the first technology since then that will actually overachieve. But the overriding issue of everybody becoming digital and going from a thousand devices connected to the internet when Cisco was found at the 18 billion today to 500 billion in a decade, the internet of things taking place at the edge, that's going to transform every business. So I always watch what's the business model change enabled by new technologies. If I'm only going to bet on three, I bet on those three. If you added a fourth, security is going to be around for a long time. A lot of bad guys uh, are involved and there's not a security architecture yet that bad guys can't find their way into. Uh, you started this answer by saying that this is a controversial call that you're making about the growth of tech companies. I mean, obviously I sit in the land of tech. Why, why do you think it's controversial? Do you think people are not getting it? Well, I think there are two co concepts here, Connie, and, and you're very good. And I'm going to actually answer the question extremely directly. The first concept is that uh, people didn't get every company becomes a tech company. Everybody says that, but they don't understand how quickly that's going to change. And so I'm really saying if you want to survive, you better become a tech company. It is not an option and you need to move quickly. The second is you're moving through new technologies at a tremendous speed, as we said in our opening comments. And the danger of uh, disruption, if you don't move that fast, is you're going to get left behind. To the third element, the jury's still out. Uh, tech for good or tech for bad? Tech based on what we want to do ourselves, including lack of diversity, or tech, I'm going to focus on my economic returns and I'm going to perhaps misuse the way I interface to consumers or legitimate concerns from government. If you do that, there's going to be a friction and the governments will probably regulate. They know they'll mess it up. And what I remind them is you can pick on the big companies all you want, but uh, unintended consequences of key regulations to small companies puts them out of business. And if you believe that. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you there because we have one minute left and I have a question that I want to ask. You have been through a lot. You have seen a lot. You've 
touched a lot of companies. What is your greatest hope or your biggest fear as we move ahead? They're actually the same. I worry that we will not dream big enough. When I talk to people, the last year in particular has been so exhausting, sheltering in place, uh, the economic downturn, the political uh, disruptions, et cetera. And I'm actually seeing people get more cautious. And that isn't good, including venture capitalists. Uh, if you believe that all job creation is going to come from startups and to uh, focus on that over the next decade, uh, we've got to have three times the number of startups, whether you're in Portugal, U.S., uh, India, uh, that we have today. So I want people to dream bigger, take the risk and go for it. It's, it's the right thing to do economically. It's also fun. Dream and make those dreams come true. Thank you, John Chambers, for your time. And I really appreciate it. Dream big. That's the message today. Now I'm going to turn it back to Lisbon and all the people there. Thank you for your time. Connie, it's been a pleasure. My pleasure as well.